Hey there, and thank you for listening to the Dream Center Peoria podcast. Dream Center Peoria exists to impact families living in poverty, starting with kids and youth. If you want to learn more about what we're up to at the Dream Center, you can find us online at dreamcenterpeoria.org or on social media at Dream Center Peoria. Thanks for listening. My name's Andy King and welcome to the Dream Center podcast. And the whole purpose of the podcast is to really bring um, some stories of hope, uh, to hear from different people that have been connected with the Dream Center, um, even uh, with some of the things that are going on in our nation right now. We, we've been trying to bring in a little bit of, of hope and peace and being able to really uh, present um, stories and uh, information that may uplift us a little bit at this time. And uh, today, I've got two guests with me. Uh, first is Seth Major, which you know from the Dream Center. He uh, is our CARES Director, DCP CARES Director, which is basically any of our type of outreach within the community. Seth heads that up. And um, and and not only do we have Seth today, which we love having Seth, uh, <laughs> but we also have Dr. Brian Fickett with us today. And this is a huge honor for us. Uh, Brian, for you to take time out. Uh, I know I, I called you last week and you said your world had changed from, from going and speaking to now doing a lot of the yeah. podcasts and things. Yeah. Um, so before we get into what we're going to talk about today, um, you may be sitting at home thinking, well, who is Dr. Brian Fickett? Well, Seth, I want you, if you could, just to give a bit of a, a synopsis, bit of a bio on, on Dr. Fickett so that people get to know him before we even hear him really speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Fickert, so great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the work of Dr. Brian Fickert, um, he is currently many things, uh, one of the most primary being that he's a professor um, uh, of economics and community development, um, president and founder of the Chalmers Center uh, for Economic Development at Covenant College. So uh, Brian joins us from uh, the area around Covenant College. Um, he's also an author, and you have maybe heard of his book called "When Helping Hurts." Um, this is uh, this has been a foundational book for us at the Dream Center. Um, as we talk about poverty alleviation and how to uh, be the most responsible in our poverty alleviation efforts. And so his book, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor or Without Hurting Yourself. Um, but uh, Dr. Fickert has also, he's kept on with that theme of uh, helping without hurting in short-term missions, in church benevolence and moving from dependence to dignity, how to alleviate poverty through church-centered microfinance. Uh, studied at Yale, his, his PhD is from Yale. Um, prior to Covenant College was uh, at a professor at the University of Maryland. And if you are a Peoria resident, if you're connected at all with either Southside Mission, Peoria Rescue Ministries, or Dream Center Peoria, then you may remember when Dr. Fickert visited us here in Peoria this last November, I believe it was, November or December, um, I think it was November, where uh, Dr. Fickert uh, visited us for the Poverty Conference, um, which was really the first of its kind for us in Peoria, for those uh, nonprofits to come together and have a really important conversation around poverty alleviation efforts. And so, um, with your uh, pedigree, we just once again welcome you to the podcast and um, remember having the chance to have lunch with you after uh, that conference day. And uh, the, don't, don't let the PhD fool you, those who are listening. This is one of the more down-to-earth people that you could ever, uh, ever be around a table with. So thanks for being here. It's great to be with you guys. Thank you. Um, you know... Um, our world in the last 
eight weeks, nine weeks uh, with the pandemic that's gone on obviously changed uh, the way we serve people who are coming to us has changed. Um, but what I want to do before we get into the new reality of what we're into, if someone had, hasn't picked up your book, When Helping Hurts, um, or Being Whole, if, if, if you had to just share about that book and what it really is trying to paint to people, how would you go about doing that and what would it be all around? Yeah, it's great to be with you guys today and, and uh, enjoy being uh, in Peoria last, last fall, last winter. And um, yeah, just thanks for the opportunity. You know, our, our work is really centered around uh, kind of a fundamental question, and, and that's this, what is poverty? Because the way that most of us answer that question is something like this. We say it's about a lack of food, a lack of clothing, lack of shelter. And, and, and that's true, of course. Uh, but, but those answers are all very material in nature. Uh, North Americans tend to define poverty as a lack of some material thing. And, and so because we tend to think of poverty as some lack of material thing, our solutions for poverty tend towards providing material things for people. And so uh, we see this at, at, at the highest level, uh, our government uh, welfare programs, and I believe there is a role for government in helping the poor, by the way, but, but that oftentimes those programs have really centered on providing material assistance. Uh, it, it's what many of our churches do. We have um, soup kitchens and clothes closets. Again, it's a material approach. And there's a role for that, again, by the way. It's what we do when we stop at a traffic light and there's a homeless person standing there and we roll on the window, we put a quarter in their hand. We're trying to solve a problem through material uh, means alone. And, and it, again, there is a material dimension of poverty, no doubt. But what's interesting is if you ask poor people around the world and in the U.S., what's it like to be poor? They, they will say things like this. I feel shame. I feel inferior. I feel less than human. I, I, I feel like I'm not part of the team, so to speak. I, I have no uh, ability to affect change in my life. And, and they tend to define poverty in far more psychological and social terms. And so that disconnect between how we think of poverty and how the poor are experiencing poverty is kind of at the heart of a crisis in poverty alleviation. So what we are doing in all of our work is trying to root our understanding of poverty and our understanding of human flourishing, of, of unpoverty, so to speak, yeah. in the biblical story. And, and what the Bible teaches is that human beings are deeply wired for relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the rest of creation. And so human flourishing is to experience those relationships in the way that God designed them to be experienced. The fall has broken all of those relationships. And for some people, that brokenness bubbles up in material poverty, a lack of food, a lack of housing, a lack of uh, clothes, and so on. But we've got to stop treating the symptoms and get to the underlying root causes, the broken relationships that underlie the symptoms of the material condition in most cases. Wow. And so that's kind of what our work is about. And then well, what is the solution? Well, the solution is the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, because the Bible teaches that, that Jesus Christ is the reconciler of all things in heaven and on earth, Colossians chapter one. And so Jesus is really the answer to the problem, but it's not just that Jesus who solves our legal problems before a holy and righteous God, as important as that is, it's a Jesus who's bringing good news for that little girl who's sold into the brothel, for, for, for that homeless person on the street corner, and for you and for me, because we're broken too. That's the essence of it. And there's all kinds of practical stuff that comes out of that, but that's the, that's the basic message. Yeah, and, and, and obviously, um, when Helping Hurts, you know, when that book came out, obviously you, you had no idea how global it was going to go. No um, idea. I mean, I had... Um, friends of mine in the UK um, when we did the conference last year they they could not believe we had got you into Peoria to do something and I'm thinking in the, and, and the, here's the crazy thing that I think you can uh, talk to a little bit and you've mentioned it already the the poverty situation whether it be in the United States 
in Europe, Australia, wherever it is, it can be addressed through Jesus. But sometimes <laughs> the followers of Jesus get it wrong in, in how we go about it. Totally. Totally. So often, look, we're, I, I'm, we're all kind of materialistic people in the West. And, and, and what, what I mean by that is not just that we like to buy cars and stuff like that. It's that our understanding of the cosmos is material. What, what I mean by that is Western civilization has kind of divorced God from his world. And so we tend to think of the world as kind of functioning like a machine, according to laws of nature that just kind of hang out there somehow. And, and, and so we tend to think of life in non-spiritual terms and in non-relational terms. We tend to think of, of, of all problems as being physical in nature. And, and so uh, that's affected Christian, Christians as well. And so uh, here's an example. Um, when, when I get sick, what do I do? Well, I go to the doctor, and if that doesn't work, I go to a specialist. And after I've seen 15 specialists and it doesn't work, I go, gee, maybe I should pray. Well, I could have prayed the first time. I could have prayed my way to the doctor's office. And I could have said, oh, man, the creator of heaven and earth could actually show up and help me in this moment, either miraculously or through the doctor. But instead, I kind of pray to God on Sunday. And then Monday through Saturday, I kind of live as though he's not that relevant. And that basic worldview, which is really screwed up and wrong, right. uh, affects how we approach the poor. We tend to try to solve things through material means. And so we're always about stuff. Drill wells, give out malaria nets, uh, 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 give out food. And again, there's a role for that. But human beings are more than just physical. And the underlying condition is relationships that flow out of the human heart. And so we've got to get from the surface down to the root causes. That's the issue. So Christians yeah. mess this up all the time, including me, all right. the time, right. all the time. And, and, and for us, you know, at the Dream Center, we've always seen those type of ministries, whether it's food or, you know, we do a big event called Backpack Peoria where we give out thousands of backpacks every year. For us, we've always seen that not so much as the bag and the supplies, but how can we now get into the world of the person that is receiving That's that? It. That's it. And, uh, it's, it's more of a vehicle to get to someone than the end result that a lot of people... That's it. You know, if, if you, it, it, it's hard to get... There's a lot of nuance in all of this. Sometimes <laughs> I was once speaking somewhere, and afterwards um, two young women came up to me and said, Brian... We, we, we applied your work in our, in our ministry. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we were staying on a street corner. And there was a 95-year-old woman, and she asked us to help her across the street. And we said, no, we don't want to create dependency on you. So we sat there and cheered for her as she walked across the street. And I thought, oh, it's great. I get to face Jesus someday, and he's going to say to me, uh, little old ladies that get walked across the street because of your book, Brian. What a great moment. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh. of, of course we should help people and, and we should walk people across streets and uh, th there's a role for uh, handing out backpacks but but those should be done in the context in most cases in the context of trying to develop longer term relationships where we can walk with people across time in ways that are really empowering and through that entire journey there's probably going to be resources flowing from us to that person but it's done in the context of empowering relationships yeah. that's the idea that's that's brilliant that's that's great now obviously as we go into this world of covid and i know seth you uh you had been uh thinking about some questions to ask today as well and i'm going to hand over to coat to to COVID. I'm going to hand over to Seth. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> that, that tells you what he thinks of the staff members, Seth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're a virus for delivery from this virus. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I'm going to hand over to Seth in a moment. But again, taking that context of what you've just talked about, and now yep. the world is turned upside down. There are you know, there's a, millions of people unemployed right now, which I feel there will be a bounce back. Yep. But 
in that time, you know, for us, for instance, we, we created a food distribution and food collection during that time. The, the reason was we were having people approach us that normally would be donors to the Dream Center, volunteers to the Dream Center, people in the community that were just reaching to us that had never reached to us before. So we had to pivot pretty quick. Um, and me and Seth <laughs> talked a few times like, I wonder what Dr. Fickett would think about this. Like, <laughs> so, First of all, call me Brian. Secondly, you <laughs> should give. You should give. There's no question. Yeah. yeah. I'll unpack that if you want. Seth, do you have a question for me? or uh, We want to hear from you. Yeah. yeah. So that, okay. So, so as, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we think poverty is rooted in broken relationships. And, and think of that um, relationship to self for a second. Uh, our relationship to self is our self-image, our self-concept, how we think of ourselves. And, and one of the qualities of, of materially poor people around the world in general, I'm painting with outrageously broad uh, strokes right now, is that many poor people have a, a, a marred identity, a sense of shame, a sense of inferiority. Well, the way that the rest of us tend to be broken is that our broken relationship with self is a sense of pride, a sense of superior, superiority, a sense that we are uniquely anointed to save the rest of the world. And so when those of us with right. pride interact with those who have a sense of shame, it's a bad mix. Because the, the ways that we act towards them, the things that we say to them, confirm in them, yeah, you're less than human, you're less capable than I am, you need me to save you. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, they, they tend to pull back, they tend to become more passive, and, and as, as, as they do that, we tend to get more disgusted. I knew they were lazy. I knew they were good for nothing. And so their shame is enhanced and our pride is enhanced. Well, that's a very common dynamic, particularly for people who are stuck in a chronic state of poverty. And so uh, in our book, we make a distinction between relief and rehab and development. And, and the idea here is that not all poverty is created equal, so to speak. Think of this example. Think of the homeless person on the street corner and think of a person who just lost their house due to a tsunami in Indonesia, let's say. Well, both parties are homeless, but the underlying conditions are completely different. The person in Indonesia maybe was a business person who was working uh, 40 hours a week, 50, 60 hours a week, and this, a natural disaster wiped out their house. That person's not suffering from a marred identity. They're, they're, they, they, they're, uh, they're full of confidence. Uh, they believe they can affect change in their world. They, they have a job. They, they, they've got skills. That homeless person is in a different situation. Uh, the one on the street corner. That person is in a chronic state of poverty that's usually deeply rooted in various kinds of, of broken relationships and so on. Well, in our book, we say that relief is the right approach in a crisis. When, when, a, when a person is helpless, uh, and, and it's uh, due to uh, either a, a, a man-made or a natural disaster, uh, some kind of handout, so to speak, is the right approach. Uh, the Good Samaritan uh, in the New Testament, it's not the purpose, that's not the point of the parable, but it's a great example. The guy's lying on the side of the road, bleeding to death, can't help himself. The Good Samaritan applies relief appropriately. Yeah. But most people around the world are not in a crisis. They're in a chronic state of poverty like that homeless person on the street corner. And for those kinds of situations, simply giving handouts will perpetuate the situation and enable that homeless person to be back on that street corner again the next day. So very different underlying conditions. For those kinds of situations, we need development, which is a long-term process of walking with people, asking them to contribute something to their improvement, coming alongside of them. So, so in most situations, poor people need development. We're in a very unusual moment here. We're, we're in a, 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 a natural crisis, and there's a whole lot of people who just need relief right now. They, they can't, uh, they don't have jobs, and, and they're in a crisis that they did not create, and they really do need relief. And so this is a moment of, for lavish outpouring, particularly for that population who's, who's in a crisis for the first time. And so it's really complicated for, for a ministry like yours. You've got to sort out, uh, is this a relief situation or a development situation? 
And the truth of the matter is, you're not always going to know. Sometimes you're going to know, sometimes you're not going to know. So what you do is you pray hard, and, and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, and you move forward, and you err on the side of compassion, and if it's wrong, it's wrong. It, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in my office at home here, and um, I, I, can, I can see out my office window my driveway. And um, in, in the past uh, 12 months or so, well, 18 months, the Lord has brought into my family's life uh, two different homeless people. And uh, uh, one of them is a success story. I won't talk about that one. The, the, the other one um, uh, is, uh, has a background of violence, violent behavior. And, and so I didn't feel like I could bring him into my house safely. I, I was afraid, afraid of him with good reason. It was winter time. He was sleeping in the woods. And one thing led to another. And my wife and I bought a, a, a small pickup truck. And we, we parked it in our driveway. And we ran a, a, a long extension cord out to it uh, with an electric blanket. And we let our friend sl sleep in the truck with an electric blanket on. He wouldn't go to a homeless shelter. And we did all kinds of stuff to walk with this person. And it was a disaster. Everything we did backfired. Uh, right across my lawn here is my neighbor who uh, is Muslim. And, and he went to my other neighbor over here who's a Christian and said, didn't Brian write some book about how to do this better? It doesn't seem like it's working. <laughs> so you just do your best. And, and that was a disaster what happened in that situation. But it's okay. Lean into it. Be generous. Show the love of Christ. Use your judgment as best you can. And then stuff happens. Brian, I'd, I'd like to weave together a couple of narratives that we've already launched in this conversation. You, uh, Of course, we kind of started talking about um, Western perspectives in two fronts on material things in general, but then also our view of God. Mm -hmm. And then I want to weave that in with how I think we would all agree that in this season of COVID, that many more people have moved to a moment of crisis. Totally. I want to weave those two things in with your latest book, Becoming Whole, how poverty alleviation is not the same as the American dream. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's bring into this conversation this idea of holistic care yeah. and providing in many ways wraparound um, care to people. Can you speak to it all? Um, once again, the tension that those who work in poverty alleviation services now are feeling with there's crisis everywhere. We need to fill in with relief efforts, but we still need to be mindful of that holistic care. Yeah. Um, how can we navigate those things? Of course, you get into this in your latest book, Becoming Whole. So perhaps you could draw a story from there or something. Um, but how are we just to balance all of that? Yeah. So this is some, this sounds like some of the essay questions I ask students on their final exam. It's got 12 <laughs> parts to it. And if they can't integrate it perfectly, they're going to fail the course. <laughs> it's not the sweats pouring off of me right now. <laughs> that was a complex question. Let me, let me do my best. All right. Yeah. We, I know you can handle it. <laughs> um, our, our, our latest book is called Becoming Whole by the Opposite of Poverty Isn't the American Dream. And there's also a field guide that goes along with that. And, and um, in many ways, these books are both the prequel and the sequel to When Helping Hurts all at the same time. And, and what I mean by that is it's the prequel in the sense that it's, it goes deeper into some deeper theology, mm -hmm. some deeper issues. It's the sequel in the sense that there's a lot of more practical sort of implications that come out of this uh, than we uh, were able to articulate when helping hurts. But uh, real quickly, I'll try. Uh, yeah, I also give my students usually four lines. I ask them a question like that, and I give them four lines, and see if your answer has to fit into those four lines. So this, <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, our book starts off saying um, something has gone deeply wrong in America and we can all feel it. And it, it, it narrates that, and it says, you know, there's this crazy thing that uh, uh, America, this is pre-COVID now, uh, our, our, our incomes and our wealth have steadily increased uh, through, throughout um, the 20th century, the 21st century. 
uh, we've experienced unprecedented and unparalleled economic growth. And yet, most of us aren't getting happier. In fact, there's good evidence that Americans are um, decreasing in their happiness. And if you actually look at um, uh, mental health, uh, suicide and anxiety and depression amongst college age young people has steadily increased from at least the 1930s to the present. And so there's this weird thing that many of us have achieved the American dream of, of, of greater peace and prosperity and yet we're not happier. In fact, there's evidence we're more and more miserable. Well, why is that? What's going on there? Well, we, we, we go into questions about, um, again, what does human flourishing look like? It's to live this, this relational life of uh, relationship with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. Then we ask questions like, how is the human being formed and how do we change? You know, we're all becoming something. We're all in the process of becoming a different kind of thing. Human beings are dynamic kinds of creatures. And, and, and poverty alleviation is about change. It's about helping somebody go from being in one situation to another situation. So there's a sense in which we have to figure out how do human beings change to figure out how all of us can achieve more flourishing, whether they we're materially poor or not. And so that's what we try to get into how does change happen? And, and what the Bible teaches is this crazy idea. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's the Bible, but it seems crazy to us. But that all of every human being is worshiping something. We, we can't help but worship. We're wired for worship. Now, by worship, I don't mean just what, what do we, uh, who do we sing to on Sunday morning, but what's the biggest polar, the biggest magnet in our lives? And the Bible teaches that we're all worshiping something and we're all transformed into the image of whatever we're worshiping. We become like the thing that we are drawn to. We take on its qualities or its characteristics. And so what poverty alleviation is fundamentally about is actually about worship. It's about ourselves and the materially poor being drawn into worship of the living God and understanding his character deeper and deeper so that we start to reflect that character more and more. And he's a deeply relational God. And so we can start to be transformed into the image of the one who bears these relationships perfectly. And the book goes on and on and on. It's, it's a beautiful read. You got to read it. Um, <laughs> I have. <laughs> but you, but once you start to define poverty alleviation as being about worship, we then start to ask, how can we create a community of worship? <clears throat> how can the Dream Center create a community that's oriented around worship of the triune God? And so this gets at your question of holism. We're in a crisis. <clears throat> We're trying to minister to people. Uh, we're giving out food. We are uh, giving out clothing. Perhaps we're giving, um, I don't know, food vouchers or housing vouchers or something. That's all spectacular. But we want that he pointed to the worship of the triune God. And so, so some, there's so many implications of this. One of them is just deep relationship across time. But one of them is we need to narrate the God we're serving. Now, that can be really creepy. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm nervous about saying it. Because uh, the, the way a lot of Christians have acted is, um, you, you know, uh, uh, we give somebody a, a, um, a box of food and, and we feel the need to share the whole counsel of God with them in that moment or, or go over the four spiritual laws with them. And that's creepy. Nobody wants that. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> who wants that? So, but, but we want to develop a relationship that, that over time leads people to say, what kind of God? Are these people worshiping yeah. and, and that they'd be drawn into the worship of that same God. And so this affects how we narrate what we're doing. It affects the posture of what we're doing. It affects our notions of what success look like. There's all kinds of implications of this, but fundamentally poverty alleviation is about a community that's worshiping the triune God and welcoming people into that community. Yeah. You gotta read the whole book. It's a lot, dude. You only give me four lines, but <laughs> but but it's it's not a manipulative kind of thing. And in, 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 it's not a um. Let me give you an example. Uh, I know of a ministry that does really dumb things, and um, 
when I ask them why they do those dumb things, they say, because we just want to share the love of Christ with people so that we can share the gospel with them to get their soul to heaven. Well, that's not love. Mm. It, it, it's not flourishing. Mm. And so we, we got to get away from this idea that we're going to use the groceries as a hook. Right. No, the groceries are good in their own right, and, and, and people need to eat, and, and, and the relationship with them is good in its own right. And so it's not all this sort of manipulative hook to get a chance to, to tell the story. The way we're living is telling the story. The, 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 the love is telling the story. They're all of value in their own right. There's yeah, a lot so more i got to say on all that. It's, yeah. I don't have enough time. Well, and, and Brian, these are conversations that um, we really have been trying to have seriously at the Dream Center, of course, uh, for the last several years. But since you visited us, um, we have uh, developed – a new initiative that I think we probably spoke a little bit about when you were here in November. It's called Here for Good. It is a, it's a neighboring ministry. Um, the origin story of Dream Center is when we launched in the city um, almost 17, 18 years ago, we wanted to know what the needs were of the surrounding community. And so we sent teams to go out door to door and simply get to know people. And for a couple of years, we were in that very helpful rhythm of identifying what were the people who live closest to our facility struggling with in their lives. And we had great uh, time doing that, and it developed into plenty of initiatives that we still hold today, mm -hmm. um, which Backpack Peoria, once again, being one of those. Um, we, in... In October, we had our year-end gathering where we set a vision out for people um, to reimagine what it would look like to get back into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, your uh, time in Peoria was very helpful. In December, we had Jonathan Brooks, who's a pastor in Inglewood, Chicago, um, uh, come and speak to us at the Dream Center as well to talk about what it looks like to be the church in neglected neighborhoods. And we have used that language of neglected as we've gathered people around to um, be a part of this initiative that we have been calling a relational reinvestment into a that. neighborhood that's been relationally disinvested in. I love that. That's terrific. And, and what you were just saying of the hooks and the grabs and all of those things we have found it to become a very important conversation to be very clear on our motivations mm -hmm. behind doing anything. Yeah. Um, have you seen in your, your wide uh, amount of work, both domestically, I know you do a large portion of your work overseas. Yeah. Um, can you speak to how important the motivation of the person doing the serving, the helping, the whatever, is to the entire process of trying to see that person's life transformed. Yeah, it's all about love. It's just about love. It's about loving, because I got nothing new to say. It's love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And it's just loving people as you would like to be loved. That's the story. And it's loving them enough to invite them into the greatest story of all, the, 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 the coming of the kingdom of God. You know, I saw this outrageous church. I was over in, um, uh, in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, I don't know when, maybe about a year and a half ago. And um, they, they, they would say that they are simply pursuing God's story of the kingdom of God, and they're inviting people to join them on that story. And it, I'm not sure they use this line, but when I was with them, it felt like taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. And, and so the way that they would do it is they would do work and they would invite the people to whom they were ministering to join them in the work. And it was, it wasn't, let's, um, let's kind of use this as the hook. It was just, we're following the greatest story ever. We're following Jesus into his kingdom. Don't you want to come with us and join us on this? I mean, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I, I, I spoke over there 
uh, briefly on some of the dangers of short-term missions as part of their launching of their short-term missions initiative. It was really great. And, and I don't know what they were thinking. And so, so they had this, um, th this uh, on Sunday morning, they had a worship service. It was outside uh, at a track, at a track meet or track stadium, sorry. And um, hundreds of people were going to run around this track to raise money for, to go on their short-term missions trips. And so my, my inspirational talk is how short-term missions can ruin the world. So, <laughs> so, so after, after I get done with my sermon, they all, uh, the service, they all start running around this track to raise money. Well, they had told me, they said, Brian, one of the people running is actually a prostitute. Mm -hmm. So they brought her to me. Her name is Claudia. And, they, and Claudia said, um, uh, sorry, the previous year, Claudia had gone on a short-term missions trip with this church to India, and she'd raised money from the other prostitutes and from the Johns in the brothel to support her short-term missions trip. Mm -hmm. And so she comes to me and she says, Brian, I don't have as many sponsors this year. Would you sponsor me? So I'm thinking, here I am about to sponsor a prostitute to go raise money for a short-term missions trip. I don't believe in short-term missions trips. I don't believe in prostitution. How's this going to work? I said, sure. <laughs> well, yeah. turns out she can run really long. So she's running nonstop. So I text my wife from Germany. I said, honey, I'm going broke on a prostitute. And my wife texts back and she says, is it tax deductible? So, so – now, now, what is that? It, it, it's that they were pursuing the kingdom, and, and it was intoxicating to everybody. And it was intoxicating to Claudia, too. And, yeah. and, and I, the next day, they, they, they have a ministry in the red light district, and they, they brought me into the red light district. And, and we're walking down the street, and, and there's this young woman who's, who's in a, in a uh, in, in, the, in a doorway and she's all curled up in a ball. And, and I, I, she, I, I, there's no nice way to say it. She, she was the most vile looking human being I've ever seen in my life. She looked like she just went to Auschwitz mm. and, and she's bald, she has shaved head and her body's covered with sores and tattoos and she's absolutely filthy and she's a prostitute there, but she's quivering in the corner and she, it, it was absolutely pathetic. And so we knelt down to talk to her, and I've seen a lot of stuff in my life. I, I literally was so physically revolted, I could barely be even near her. It, it was just so horrifying. And uh, her name is Jessica, and she's in her mid-20s. My oldest daughter's name is Jessica, and she's in her mid-20s. Hmm. And uh, she says, hand me your cell phone. So one of, the, one of the people from the ministry handed her the cell phone, and she, she got it out, and she, she started poking at it and, and her fingers are so filthy that you just and she calls up a song and she presses it and she starts singing it and it's you are my god you never forget me you know where i am even here and she was raised in a christian household her father had sexually abused her and she flipped out and she ends up living this kind of lifestyle as we're sitting and talking to her, who comes walking down the street but Claudia, the prostitute that I'm, I'm helping get to on a short-term missions trip, and she's walking her dog down the street like she's going to the office. Claudia sees me and says, Brian, my benefactor. Well, I'm not sure that I wanted to be introduced to the red light district as the benefactor of a prostitute, but here we go. Well, Claudia then gets down on the ground, and we're talking to this girl, Jessica, and Claudia says to her, why don't you get up right now and walk out of here with these people? And so I'm, I'm with a prostitute ministering to another prostitute. Now, how does that happen? Hmm. It's that the story of the kingdom of God is a mighty rushing wind, and we need to jump into that jet stream and pull people into it with us, and they're going to want to go into it. This is the best story ever. That's but it's a different approach. It's come and see. That's a long story. I'm sorry. But it's, no, it's, that's I've good. never seen anything like it. It, it, I, it felt like I, it felt like I stepped into the jet stream of God's movement. And it yeah. was a different posture from how can I fix you? It was come, let's go see him. Wow. And, and for the church that you are with, obviously that speaks a whole different language for them oh. that they're seeing it in action in a way that they may not have seen before. 
300 Muslim refugees have been baptized in the past year by this church in Frankfurt, Germany, which isn't exactly the center of, of Christendom right now. I mean, it's just secular as all get out. 300 Muslim refugees baptized in the past year. Wow. It's a different approach to different posture. Yeah. It's not us versus them. It's we're all in this together. Come and see what I've discovered. Mm, he's the king of kings and Lord of Lords. Let's go feast on him together. He's better than anything else. Wow. In your travels, Brian, I mean, you mentioned about Frankfurt and seeing something like that. And, and even um, with this time where, you know, you've been at home and not traveling, <laughs> right? Um, going into when things start to ease back. Yeah. You know, I, I heard a preacher the other week talk about, um, does God want us to go back to normal? Mm. Yeah. Is, is there things that you have learned, even just observing the church globally, um, and also hearing how the church is at to step out of, of what they normally do, right? Yeah. And, and uh, have to really assess what's going to happen after COVID. Um, what are you seeing and feeling? I mean, we, you know, for, for what we're about to do with Here for Good, we do feel it was a bit of a God thing, really, because our first time out was uh, the, la the first weekend of March, right? And then we had the pause. And now we're starting to do things that, you know, obviously going back into the neighborhoods. I mean, Seth lives in the neighborhood where we're at. He has a church. He's a church planter, even though he's on staff at the Dream Center. He also has a church right in the neighborhood. So he's been around it. Spectacular. Every day. Yeah. But for visitors that are coming with us and people who are coming with us for this journey, what are some of the things you've seen globally that you may be like, you may need to rethink that. Oh yeah. It's a good yeah. question. What are some yeah. of the things you're seeing? Great question. So uh, I want to be careful with this because you know, I haven't lost my job. And so, so um, I'm not suffering. And, and so it's really easy for me to sit here and say, gee, there's some really great things that I'm experiencing right now. Um, and I am, but I haven't lost my job. And so I think I might feel differently if I was in that situation. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we do want the economy to, to, to get going again. We do want people to be able to work. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's a real thing. And, and we don't want to downplay that. But, you know, many of us are caught in a rat race. And, and you know, I, it, I remember the, the week before COVID hit, my body physically hurt because I was working so hard and I, I was on a treadmill. I wasn't getting enough rest. I mean, I was like this every day at work. And you know what? I don't want to go back to that. I'm still working hard, but it's not the same pace. I'm not traveling to Peoria when it's freezing cold. I'm sitting here in my head. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think many of the people who are listening to this broadcast have probably experienced um, probably more conversations with their neighbors than they've had in a long time. Mm. Uh, when I go for walks in the evening in my neighborhood, uh, people are out on their porches waving to me in ways they haven't been in the 23 years I've lived here. They're, they're, we're being forced into a slower pace of life, and I think it's good for us. Um, yeah. I think we're also discovering prayer rediscovering prayer. Many of us are praying harder now than we have in a long time. Some of those prayers are, are um, I think, becoming, you know, what some people call really kingdom prayers. They're a little bit higher at level of praying. Lord, uh, there are spiritual forces at work in the world right now. We've got this virus. We've got racism exploding, and there's carnage in our streets. Lord Jesus, come quickly and come soon. And so we're, we're moving away from... Um, uh, Lord, could I have a nice Christmas present to Lord, may your kingdom come. And, and, yeah. I, and so I think community, kingdom prayers, uh, relationship, and that's kind of at the center of the kingdom of God. And so it, it's a funny paradox right now. These are the best of times and the worst of times in, in many ways, I think, for many of us. And we are yeah. seeing that around the world. Um, um, 
I have a, I, you know, I'm not a world traveler. I, I'm not, I'm just a guy, but I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's very in touch with, um, uh, the underground or, or the oppressed church, let's say, kind of marginalized and oppressed churches all over the world. The African American church in the United States, but in Iran and in, in, in Asia, all over the world. And she says that everybody she's talking to right now is saying something is percolating at the bottom. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it feels like the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness is, it's always there, but it seems to be elevated. And, and that, it not not just in the uh, protests that we're seeing uh, here in our country. That's one manifestation. But she said, Brian, it's a symptom. There's a conflict that seems to be heightened right now, all over the world, and those who are in marginalized communities can sense it. And, and so I don't know what that all means, but there's something. It feels that there's something really spiritual happening, yeah. um, and and that we've got to dig into the word of God and to prayer and fasting. And I, I find myself reading my Bible more deeply now and, and, and um, clinging to it in, in a way that I haven't in a long time. And so all of those are good things. And my fear is that we'll return to life the way it was before. Yeah. I don't want to return to that. Right. Right. Something well, different. Well, um, you know, I, I heard a, a speaker saying about how, God always does things for our good, even though sometimes it's hard to get to the good. And totally, uh, I, I know there are even with the unrest, with the racism right now that has been, uh, you know, globally, not just in the U.S., but what yep. has been happening in response to what had been seen with Mr. Floyd, and um, but yet I I know that there is going to be change it may not be uh governmental change it may not be city change but there is change within a lot of people's hearts that could then lead to city change government so. things like that. i hope so and look at look at some of the incredible acts of heroism we're seeing uh, you, you know i don't know if you saw the image of that police officer who became isolated and five or six strangers from the African-American community banded around him and protected him. They didn't even know each other. They knew he was in trouble. And they banded around him and protected him from the protesters. And what incredible courage and, and, and um, love. And I mean, so right in the middle of chaos and horror, there's these incredible acts of bravery and courage and love. And so it's all, there's a lot of drama right now. Yes, there is. Well, we want to, uh, Brian, thank you for taking the time during this crazy time. Uh, I know for you, uh, when we talked last week, uh, you you jumped at it immediately to, to be with us today. And uh, what you have shared, I know there's going to be people uh, that are going to be changed, that are going to... Uh, look at a different way of how we actually reach out to people and uh, I just want to thank you for being with us today as well as as you Seth uh, you can tell Seth is the smarter one of the two of us is of the three of us uh, <laughs> I, I, I still don't know what the question was he asked me I got, <laughs> that, means, that means I need to keep working on asking questions. 12 part question go <laughs> That's right. And in 50 words or less, I need you to respond to it. Brian, um, Brian, where can people follow along with your work at the Chalmers Center? Yeah, so the Chalmers Center, it's spelled C-H-A-L as in Larry, M as in Mary, E-R-S, Chalmers. Uh, it, it's named after a um, Scottish Presbyterian minister in the um, 19th century who said the church needs to get back to the city and needs to get back to holistic ministry hmm. um, uh, Our website is chalmers.org. We're a church equipping organization. We, we don't want low-income people to ever hear of us rather we want to um, Equip the local church and parent church by extension to be what the Bible says the church is the body bride and fullness of Christ so so we, we design strategies churches can use 
and uh, other kinds of training tools and resources. We field test those, and out of that, we train churches to use those on their own. And so um, we love what you folks are doing in Peoria. I had a marvelous time there uh, uh, last fall and got to meet with you guys. And God is doing something in Peoria. Uh, you, you know, it, um, you could feel it. And, and the spirit that was there, the collaboration between different ministries was unparalleled. I loved it. I love what God is doing there. And that's why I was so honored to be asked to be with you guys today. And, oh. and um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what the spirit will continue to do in your city. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And again, um, if you're listening to this podcast or watching us, uh, make sure you're checking out everything that goes on at the Dream Center, dreamcenterpeoria.org. Again, there are many ways, especially now that we're about to, hopefully come out of this uh, COVID time, there are many ways that you can partner with us to be able to then go and build relationships with the folks that we, we serve each and every day, whether that's in our homeless shelter, whether it's with our students in our 309 program, with our trade school, whether that's with Here for Good, with Seth and the team that goes out. There's ways that you can connect. And the best way to connect to us is through the website. So make sure you go on there, dreamcenterpeoria.org, and just check out everything that's happening in the area. Well, again, Dr. Fickett, thank you so much. We Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Seth, thank you for being with us. Thanks. Thank Great you. Great to be with you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank, I, it's, it's all uh, ended. So I... Again, that was so good. I, I just really was uh, exactly what we were wanting. Uh, and, and just to bring some light for folks. We have questions all the time about what we do and how we do it. And, and you've been able to paint a picture of, of everything. It's great. Seth, are you just got anything else to say? I, uh, I remember you talking about Germany when we went to lunch. That's... That's Chris Zimmerman. He's with the Church of the Nazarene, which is our tribe. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. I so um, I, was with, I was with Chris in Indianapolis, Indiana, two years ago for an urban uh, leadership summit, and he blew our minds then. And um, yeah, I, I remember when we were at lunch, he's saying <laughs> Germany that. and yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I that. Well, I've yeah. got an email. In fact, I owe him an email anyways. I got to email and tell him that, that I got to be with you. And that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, he, he definitely won't remember me. I remember him. Um, but thank you once again for sharing those stories because we want to get swept up into that kingdom yeah. stuff too. So yeah. Yeah. very, very, very inspirational. Thank you so much. I believe in what you guys are doing. Keep going. Thank you. Thank I know you so much. Hard work. It's, 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 I know there's days you all just want to quit. But thank you. For, I'm, yeah, I mean, it looks like, you know, like today. But after which, I had which more day? on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but just keep going. You're doing. You're doing God's work. Keep going. Thank Thanks, you Brian. So much. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, we just had an incredible interview with Dr. Fickett and uh, his insight into. Uh, not only what's going on now, but also uh, around the world and with what he's written in his book and even how that still uh, is true to today, that Jesus is the answer. Loving on people is the way to really combat poverty and being able to be and journey with people. And so, uh, again, we were humbled to have him uh, on the podcast today, but we just wanted to follow up uh, with uh, what Seth was talking about, which was about our program called Here for Good. It's something that we believe strongly in. As Seth mentioned in the interview, it was something that actually launched the Dream Center, how we were finding the needs of the community, and then being able to create and bring people along the journey with all the different things that we do at the Dream Center. So, Seth, I know you wanted to, to share something, some exciting news uh, yeah. coming out of this COVID time. So uh, go for it, man. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Just like so many people, we've had to figure out how to restart, whether it's regathering a church, whether it's reopening a business or 
um, uh, in this case, relaunching an initiative, we have had to figure out how we can do it uh, safely, not only for our volunteers, but for the people that were wanting to visit and, and the people that were wanting to uh, become friends with. So um, just to catch everyone up very, very quickly, we launched the Here for Good initiative the first Saturday morning of March, this last March, just a few months ago, but seems like a long time. <laughs> and um, we were able to send out about 60 people that had signed up for Here for Good and took place uh, in a training between October at our year-end event at Bradley called Rooted is when we first had people get interested in the Here for Good initiative. We did two trainings over the winter season and then we launched the first Saturday of March with 60 people um, covering about 100 houses between uh, that group divided up into teams and we were able to visit just about 100 houses in the near north side, North Valley neighborhood that is just uh, northeast of downtown, just a few steps away from Dream Center's facility in downtown Peoria. And then we had to stop, of course, because of how COVID has affected um, all of our lives in, in some way, shape, or form. And so we did have to pause, unfortunately, the Here for Good initiative. Um, in its fullest sense. Right. Um, we had volunteers that did go door to door um, in the month of April and May um, and June just to drop off notes at, at the doorstep. They wore masks, they um, just simply, they didn't knock on any doors, they just simply handed a note saying, we're from the Dream Center, we can't wait to see you again. Um, this last, uh, first Saturday of June, this last month here in June, we had teams of people going out, uh, a very small team, just keeping that connection up. Um, once again, not knocking on doors, but dropping off flowers, uh, carnations, as well as uh, those notes, just saying, we can't wait to see you again. And had some incredible feedback from that small team, because it's summer, right? I mean, people are outside, they're on their porches, they're walking around. The world is starting to uh, slowly come back together here and our neighborhoods in Peoria are no exception to that. So yes, the exciting news. Hopefully the interview that you just watched, the conversation that you were just able to have along with us and Dr. Ficker, hopefully that has inspired you to do something and I would like to say do something new. I would imagine that if we all desire to step into this new season, wanting things to, in fact, not be the same, but look different. Um, Dr. Fickard expressed that, Andy, and I know you and I both share that. I think a lot of people are sharing that something's got to give. Yeah. Something new needs to happen. And so we want to extend an invitation to you, everyone watching this, if you're living in Peoria or the Peoria region, um, to get involved in Here for Good, which is officially relaunching the first Saturday of August, which happens to be August 1st. So it's going to be really easy to remember. First day of August, first Saturday morning of August, we are relaunching the rhythm of sending the same teams of people to knock on the same doors in the same neighborhoods on the first Saturday of every single month. That was the mission we set out to do, Andy, this last March. We had to pause, but we are relaunching those efforts on uh, Saturday, August 1st, the first Saturday of August. And the date that we want you to save, not only August 1st, but we want you to save the date of Saturday, July 11th. It's the second Saturday of July. And that's when we're going to be holding a training at Dream Center Peoria for anyone who wants to get involved in Here for Good. Uh, everyone who was with us in March went through a few different training opportunities over the winter that we had. We're going to be offering that same training at the Dream Center on Saturday, July 11th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we want you to save that date, time, and place. But I'm going to explain a couple of different options here. 
So the training is going to be, once again, Saturday, July 11th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Dream Center Peoria, 714 Hamilton Boulevard, right downtown. If we feel, though, it's going to be Eight, we're going to be able to meet in the same room. If we feel as though there's going to be a room where we can all meet in together in a group of 50 or less, and that's assuming that we're going to be in stage four as a region, which of course we're hopeful for, um, then we're all going to be in the same room practicing distancing, asking people to wear masks, sanitation options are going to be provided as well. If we feel that that would not be the best thing to do, um, then we are still going to be at Dream Center, but we're going to have people split up into different rooms where they can be in smaller groups watching the training happening on a Zoom call. We believe that there's power in gathering, and we believe that there's power in even a couple of people being together in the same room. And so we want to be able to leverage that. So that's what we're going to do at Dream Center on July 11th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So I want to invite you to that training. If you feel like the Here for Good initiative is the next step that you need to take. Once again, you're going to learn a lot more on July 11th. But that is something that takes place on the first Saturday of every single month. And we ask people who sign up for Here for Good to earmark that as the new rhythm for you, maybe your family and the people that you live with. The first Saturday of the month becomes a time where people neighbor, a time where we check in on each other and where we visit well. So I get really excited about it. So Andy, I'm gonna stop there, but that's the good news is that, is that Here for Good is coming back. First Saturday of August, we're launching and we're doing an onboarding training on Saturday, July 11th at Dream Center from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, Andy, if anyone has any questions on that, they can check out our website, dreamcenterpeoriaorg slash here for good. We have our own landing page there. That's where you can find out more information. That's where you can get a hold of me at the Dream Center. That's where you can RSVP for the July 11th training because we want to know who's going to be there. Um, but yeah, Andy, we're excited and we can't wait. Yeah, and I know for um, you and all of the folks that went out in March and have literally been waiting since last October from yeah. from Rooted, that uh, you guys are going to knock it out of the park once you get out there uh, August 1st. It's, it's going to be one of those things where... Um, it's, it's a bit like what we did last year. I don't know if you remember it, Rooted. We gave everyone a bulb mm -hmm. and said, go and plant it. And then in the spring, these bulbs were now becoming flowers. It's as though God has wanted to keep it in the ground a little bit longer. Even though a lot of people went out on that first day, it's as though when we step into this new season in August, I truly feel that the need is going to be greater, that yeah. people's hearts will be open more because of probably what they've gone through in the last three months to four months by the time we go there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, God has a plan for everything. It's, it's not our ways, it's his ways. And uh, we're just super excited. So, Seth, thanks for stepping back uh, in after the interview. And again, you heard what Seth said. Go to the website, dreamcenterpure.org, slash here for good. You'll be able to get all the information. There's some videos on there. There's many different things, connections on there to Seth. And, uh, and you can get ready for August 1st and the July 11th uh, training. So, yeah. Seth, thanks for stepping back yeah. into the room with me. And... Uh, we will see you again next time on the podcast here at Dream Center Peoria. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again for listening to the Dream Center Peoria podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you know of anyone that would be interested in hearing about what we just talked about, we would encourage you to share this episode with them. Be sure to stay tuned for future episodes. Thanks. Thanks.